Ex-President Juan Orlando Hernández has only a few hours left in Honduras. On Wednesday night, Security Minister Ramón Savillón confirmed that on Thursday he will be trafficking and the use of weapons. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu met with President Vladimir Putin to inform him that the city of Mariupol is under the control of the Russian army. An explosion at a mosque in the Afghan city of mazar sharif has so far left at least 25 people dead and more than 60 injured, some of them severely. Hi, this is From the South. I am your news anchor, Dio Martin, from the Telstar Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. Ex-President Juan Orlando Hernández has only a few hours left in Honduras. On Wednesday night, Security Minister Ramón Savillón confirmed that on Thursday he will be extradited to the United States, where he is wanted on three charges associated with drug trafficking and the use of weapons. It will be precisely Savillón's office, the one that will execute the extradition order at 7 o'clock local time. A commission of the United States Anti-Drug Agency will be waiting for him at the Hernana Costa Mejia Air Base in Tegucigalpa. On April 13th, the Honduran Supreme Court ordered the extradition of Hernandez to the United States after the resolution was signed by the 15 judges that make up the full court. In a press appearance, the Minister of Security confirmed the calls and procedures that will take place during the operation. In accordance with the extradition agreement that exists with the United States of America and following the legal norms issued by the Supreme Court of Justice through the natural judge, we will proceed to execute the extradition order of citizen Don Juan Orlando Hernandez Alvarado on Thursday, April 21st, 2022 at 7 a.m. at the Hernana Costa Mejias Air Base. The National Congress of Honduras approved on Wednesday night the total elimination of the Economic Development Deployment Zones, the ZEDE, from all legal regulations of the country. The repeal required a qualified majority vote, that is, more than 86 votes, and achieved the unanimous support of all 128 lawmakers of the congressional benches. In this way, the ZEDE are eliminated both from the constitutional reform approval and ratification contained in the creation and from the decree containing the organic law that was passed in June 2013. It only remains for the complete abolition to be ratified in the next legislature in 2023. In Nicaragua, the National Assembly eliminated the legal personality of several non-government organizations that did not comply with the requirements of the law. With 74 votes in favor, Parliament approved the cancellation of the legal personality status of 25 organizations that did not comply with the various regulations as per a report by the government ministry. The report states that many of these organizations refuse to register as foreign agents even though they do, they do receive funding from other countries. Moreover, many of these organizations had failed to submit their financial statements and in some cases they had no one at the board of directors. This decision is part of a process of purging and reorganizing these NGOs that did pursue profit but were protected by the NGO status to exist legally. The president of the National Assembly, Gustavo Borra, said that in these cases their legal personality as NGOs has been canceled but that they will be able to continue their activities. The organizations in these situations have lost their legal personality as NGOs, but they will continue to have a legal status as commercial entities. These, in agreement with the law for business organizations and the law for the protection of trademarks and other distinctive signs. On Thursday in The Hague, the Netherlands, deliberations at the International Court of Justice on the Managua case concerning alleged violations of rights in the Caribbean Sea committed by Bogota have come to an end. The court concluded that Colombia had indeed violated Nicaragua's sovereign rights. The court's ruling reads, Colombia has violated its international obligation to respect Nicaragua's rights and jurisdiction over its exclusive economic zone. 
The court ruling states that Colombia has interfered with Nicaraguan fishing, oceanographic research, and vessels. The International Court, which is the legal arm of the United Nations, ordered Colombia to stop the violations and to allow the Raizales, a Colombian native tribe, to fish in the Nicaraguan exclusive zone. Managua argued during the hearings that Bogotá also violated its sovereignty because of the operations of the National Navy in the Caribbean Sea and for having issued a decree establishing an integral zone in the archipelago. Representatives of seven permanent commissions of Cuba's National Assembly visited the province of Pinal del Rio on Wednesday to evaluate the effects of national policies and to carry out some of the priority programs of the Caribbean islands. The commissions will carry out the program which will conclude dialogues with citizens from San Riz, San Juan and Martinez and Pinar del Rio, among other cities of the province. The deputies will also exchange on essential topics with the population and government representatives. These topics include the information policy, the possibility of establishing digital television, and the evolution of the fight against the pandemic, among other relevant issues. This was confirmed by the president of the Services Commission, Maria del Carmen Concepcion. We update the information in Nicaragua where there was an earthquake of 6.8 magnitude in the early hours of Thursday morning. So far, no deaths nor injured people have been reported and there has been little damage to infrastructure. The earthquake originated 54 kilometers southwest of Masachapa at a depth of 25 kilometers. According to the Nicaraguan Institute of Territorial Studies in a term by its acronym in Spanish, the quake resulted from movement of the Cocos and Caribbean tectonic plates and although a tsunami warning was issued, there is little chance of such an occurrence. On a phone interview, Nicaraguan Vice President Rosario Murillo said there had been no injuries nor deaths and called on to give priority to the care to people with disabilities. In the Philippines, the tropical storm known as Megi left 224 fatalities so far, according to a report released by the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council. According to the update, 174 people are missing and another eight are injured. Storm Maggie made landfall on April 10th, causing considerable damage in nine regions of the country. The National Council said that more than 33,000 people were evacuated as a preventive measure and another 175,000 have been displaced by the rains. At the same time, the Philippine government opened 447 evacuation centers to receive and care for the affected. We're going to take a short break. Join us again after this. Hi, and welcome back to From the South. In Peru, Wednesday night, the government declared a state of emergency in the south of the country. This was announced by Labor Minister Betsy Chavez following a meeting of the government cabinet. Chavez said the government made the decision taking into account the ongoing social conflict in the province of Mariscal Nieto concerning the miners' camp of Guajone at a mine operated by southern Peru. Since last February 28th, the communities of Tumilca, Tala, Pocata, and Coscore have kept the railroad tracks and the water reservoir blocked, preventing the mine from working. In addition, they have caused some damage to the camp, which houses over 5,000 people and other areas of sensitive interest, such as schools and hospitals. In Brasilia, Brazil's capital, on April 20th, the Union Court of Accounts suspended for 20 days the hearing on the privatization of Eletrobras, a company that produces almost 30 percent of the electricity generated in the country. The Court of Accounts will decide whether to approve the privatization of Eletrobras, one of the largest electric companies in Latin America. The proposal to privatize this company was personally delivered by President Bolsonaro on February 23, 2021, as part of his liberal agenda. Meanwhile, former President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva warned about such a move which would put the country's energy sovereignty and security at risk, saying that it would be like handing over a priceless patrimony on a silver platter. Lula argues Bolsonaro will sell it at a banana price, qualifying the decision as a transgression against the people and the future of his country.
In Haiti, anxiety increases due to the latest fuel shortage, which has forced the closure of some gas stations, giving way to long lines in the few that remain open. According to a source connected to the French newspaper Le Nouvelliste, the domestic market has about five days of supply for the Port Terminal still stores 70 percent of the country's old products, with a little over 16,000 barrels of diesel, at least 44,308 barrels of gasoline, and more than 29,000 barrels of kerosene. The National Association of Oil Products Distributors did not hesitate to alert the authorities to take some action so that deliveries are made immediately. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu met with President Vladimir Putin to inform him that the city of Mariupol is under the control of the Russian army. During his meeting, the minister assured that at the beginning of the operation, the number of the Ukrainian armed forces and foreign mercenaries exceeded 8,000. To date, 4,000 have been neutralized and 1,478 surrendered. At the present, there is a remnant of 2,000 entrenched in the Azovstal metallurgical plant. Shogu reported that the Ukrainian military deployed armored vehicles and artillery on the first floors of the residential buildings, as well as snipers on the upper floors, while gathering civilians on the intermediate floors to use them as human shields. Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered the cancellation of the assault on the metallurgical plant, stating that the priority was to save the lives and integrity of his soldiers. Organizations and alternative media have denounced on Thursday the disappearance and possible kidnapping of Chilean citizen Gonzalo Lira Lopez by Ukrainian forces. Gonzalo Lira, Chilean American journalist, novelist, and filmmaker, denounced a few days ago on his social networks the possibility of something happening to him. The author pointed directly to the Kraken unit of the Azov Battalion. On his social networks, the communicator carried a strong campaign of denunciations for the kidnapping, disappearance, torture, and extraordinary execution of a number of Ukrainian and foreign citizens opposed to the government of President Volodymyr Zelensky, including a long list of mayors who have been executed by the paramilitary forces sponsored by Kyiv and NATO, which has been silenced by Western media. Several organizations outside Ukraine denounced the situation of Lida as they fear that he has been tortured and executed. They urgently request the intervention of the Chilean government. The Russian government warned that its country must prepare for a possible aggression by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. During a speech at a meeting of the Board of Directors of the Council of Science and Education of the Eurasian Nation, the deputy chairman of the country's Security Council, Dmitry Medvedev, pointed out that in the current tense situation, both the scientific and technological spheres play an important role in ensuring the security of the state. In this regard, he stressed the need to advance in innovative developments and research in order to maintain the country's defensive capabilities and counter the most serious threats it faces. These declarations are based on recent statements by Sweden and Finland about their possible entry into NATO. Russian President Vladimir Putin stated that Russia will act consistently to make sure that life in Ukraine's eastern industrial heartland normalizes. Speaking at a meeting with members of a state-funded nonprofit group designed to offer social lifts for, Rus uh, for Russians from all walks of life, Putin pledged that, government will, that his government will act consistently and make sure that life normalizes and will change for the better. The president stated that hostilities in eastern Ukraine prompted Russia to launch a special military operation. Putin said the idea to perform the national anthem and to raise the Russian flag in schools in Donbass would be demanded. That was happening in Donbass, including the Luhansk People's Republic, forced Russia to start this military operation everyone knows about now. First of all, the goal of this operation is to help our people living in Donbass. Russia's Ministry of Defense said the first test launch of a Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile was successfully carried out Wednesday from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome. The new missile is reportedly capable of hitting long-range targets using different flight trajectories. According to the Defense Ministry, the missile has unique characteristics that allow it to overcome with guarantee all existing and prospective missile defense systems. The ministry also considers that the Sarmat as a most powerful missile with the longest target range in the world and that will significantly strengthen the combat capability of Russia's strategic nuclear forces.
We have more news coming up after one final short break. Please stay with us. Hi and welcome back. An explosion at a mosque in the Afghan city of mazar sharif has so far left at least 25 people dead and more than 60 injured, some of them severely. What is known so far is that the events occurred when dozens of worshippers were praying during the holy Islamic month of Ramadan. As confirmed by the director of the main hospital in the area, Dr. Gwashudin Ansari, the dead and injured have arrived at the hospital in ambulances and private vehicles. According to local media, the number of dead and injured is expected to reach 100. So far, no group has claimed responsibility for the attack but its characteristics could be an intervention of a Daesh member in the province of Khorasan. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson, arrived on Thursday at the Ahmedabad airport in India. He has begun a two-day visit to the country to promote free trade agreement negotiations and increase ties in the area of defense. Within hours of his arrival in Gujarat, Boris Johnson will hold a meeting with the main leaders of business groups to discuss essential issues related to economic and commercial ties as part of his agenda. Boris Johnson will also visit the Gujarat University of Biotechnology and the Akshardham Temple in Gandhinagar before leaving for the capital, New Delhi. Another one of the points to be covered in this tour will be the negotiations of the free trade agreement as well as the evaluation of the implementation of the 2030 roadmap and the vision for intensifying cooperation and exchange on regional and global issues. On Thursday, after a long night of bombardment against the Gaza Strip, Israeli troops again attacked the al aqsa Mosque in East Jerusalem, intensifying clashes between Palestinian worshippers and the occupiers' troops persist. It is the second time after last Friday that the Israeli police broke into the sacred precinct that is part of the complex known as the Esplanade of the Mosques. Muslim worshippers have shared videos on social networks where it can be seen that the occupying forces fired gas and rubber bullets into the holy compound. According to Palestinian media, a large number of injuries have already been reported. Several Palestinian organizations, such as the Islamic resistance movement Hamas, have threatened to respond to this new aggression. Chinese President Xi Jinping made a proposal to ensure security around the world and respect for state sovereignty. The president made the statement during the inauguration of the annual conference of the Boao Forum for Asia 2022. The head of state insisted on prioritizing unity, cooperation, and mutual respect among states. He also called for, for multilateralism, the resolution of conflicts through consultation, and the defense of the international system centered on the United Nations Organization and the joint fight against climate change. The dignitary affirmed that the COVID-19 pandemic showed that humanity can suffer and fight together to overcome difficulties. In this sense, he indicated that peace, the coordination of macro policies, as well as science and technology, are fundamental to respond to global problems. Ivory Coast's new Vice President Tiemko Melit Konya took the oath of office on Wednesday before the Constitutional Council, a day after his appointment to the post, which was vacant for nearly two years. On Tuesday, in front of deputies and senators gathered in Congress in the Ivorian capital, Yamasukru, President Ouattara announced the appointment as Vice President of Mr. Konya, Governor of the Central Bank of West African States since 2011. He was also Cabinet Director of Prime Minister Guillaume Soro between 2007 and 2010 and Minister of Construction, then Special Advisor to President Alassane Ouattara, in charge of economic and monetary issues. The post of Vice President enshrined in the last constitutional reform of 2016 had been vacant since July 2020 with the resignation of Daniel Kablan Duncan for personal reasons. I am aware of the honor that has been bestowed upon me. I am also aware of the responsibility of the task that is now mine and which I intend to approach by your side with humility and determination. We've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at Telstar English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telstar English, I am Dio Martin. Thank you for watching.